There we go. That's good. Hello. <laughs> Welcome back to Bellwetter No. Uh, Hello. Hello. We're, we're just sitting here talking about some things. Guys, before we get started today, I want you to hit that like and share. Go to our Bellwetter No YouTube. We got three new subscribers this week. Thank you. Killing it. You're uh, killing it. We're getting there, guys. Yeah. Go out, th- go out there and show us some love. I mean, if we can't help you, maybe we can help one of your buddies or something like that. So share us, you know, like us, whatever. Make us feel good. Um, so anyways, we've been on this long journey to get to where we're at now. Um, and, uh, you know, today we're going to kind of talk about what the road that took us to go get help and how we're kind of dealing with things today to kind of help you out a little bit. Uh, for those of you that were wondering, um, so, yeah. well, before we get started on that, I want to kind of close up the end on mine. Yeah. Because we left with me in the military. Um, long story short, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you guys kind of need to know what we're doing now. I was asked, we caught orders again, and I was asked to stay behind because of that accident. I told everyone about that last that last um, podcast. And I was, I, I was asked to stay behind because they were stop lossing people, so I had, potentially we we're all stop lost. And I got out on time because I had a couple people looking out for me after that rough patch in the deployment, that second half of it. And... Um, so get out. My plan is to become a cop. Do that in Texas. Uh, there's, get, I'm just going to touch barely on this. And then I did some private contract work overseas. And I'm doing what I do now in Colorado. I'm not going to say too much of, on that either, um, what I do. But along that way, when I first got out, before I got out, I was directed to go seek treatment because of the accident. And I didn't like it because I was told to do it, right? So anyone getting out of the military knows one of the hardest things getting out is transitioning from your military mindset to your civilian mindset. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I promise I lasted three weeks before I, uh, before I called the retention and see, I cannot remember his name. He's like, that's not how I said, I need to come back. Like, I just want to come back. He's like, that's just not how it works. And uh, so I started struggling with a few things. I was in a relationship and I, I knew it was bad. I was very, very angry. I was really jealous. And long story short on that is I ruined that relationship. And that's when I knew I had to get help for myself. So I started my path to getting help for myself in 2010 2010 because i got out of the army in 08 so it took i remember it took me two years of struggling and just facing these challenges every day that i didn't have to face come to find out if i just manned up and went and did it myself so that's what i did in 2010 and that's where i started that journey and the va at that time sucked really bad and we all know that we, we they didn't know what they were dealing with bringing back combat veterans from the war in Iraq because of, they were just overloaded. And I don't think they had any, they didn't have any um, program set. They didn't, nothing like that. So it was a struggle from the get go for all of us that reached out to get help, but eventually it got better and I kept just chugging along and I finally got to the place that I'm in now. And what keeps me grounded now is my family. So that's, you know, and I still go to my my annual appointments and stuff like that for the VA and all that good stuff. And I, I sought out some other programs that they offered just because they were there. Because if you don't continue, you know, who's good at saying that is slow. If you look at what he says, that if you look at what he says on Facebook and stuff, he's always pushing people to get Let's out there get yeah. and go get help, continuous help. So yeah. he, he takes advantage of all kinds of programs that the VA offers. And they're getting better. So I just kind of wanted to get that out of the way. Um, I'm not going to go too much in depth on 
the whole life after the military. I, I'm, I'm in a good place with the family and job and stuff like that. So, but we chose to get, I chose to get help 10 years ago and it's been a journey ever since and it's going to continue to be so. Nice, dude. I mean, now when you first went to the VA, you, and we all say we know it sucks, you know, and, and it sucked or whatever. Did you have any issues with the people that actually work there or was it just a slow process? Um, both. So initially, my first anger management group, I was asked to leave. Nice. It's not funny. It's not funny. But, no, but um, I mean, I understand. It was because I was, I was frustrated with the whole process in itself. You know, the one that talked me into getting my my disability going from was my mother. And the way she put it was, you know, you went to combat, you deserve that stuff. And now I'll push everyone to do that. But I think I was frustrated with the beginning stages of everything because it, it to, to me, it seemed like they didn't have their shit together. Right. No, no, they don't. You know what I mean? See what, what drove me to it. See, I went years, I went years without thinking there was something wrong. I thought yeah. everybody else was crazy. <laughs> yeah, you thought they were messed up. I mean, I know it sounds nuts looking back at it, but I was so high strung. I was so uh man wound up so tight that it was unreal. Um I didn't even see kelp till about three years ago. Yeah. A and um two, three years ago around that area, around that time frame. But uh I, the girl I was dating at the time, I guess I had finally drove her up the wall and she flat out told me either you're going to go get help or I'm done. Like, I can't deal with you. You're, you're crazy. Yeah. And I, you know, I'll get to that story here in a minute, but you know, like when I first, this is the thing that I didn't, I didn't understand. I worked for a company, um, and I was in the oil field, working in the oil field. We worked on uh, downhole rod pumps. Well, when they come out of the hole, sometimes they have scale on them, you know, from chemicals and stuff downhole that get on them. Well, when you repair one of those pumps, you have to get the scale off, you know, to repair the pump. And, you know, the pump is, you know, 20, 24 foot long you know, sometimes longer or shorter, whatever. But I, I remember this day, like it was yesterday. Um, I was working on the pump and I was buffing the scale off of one of the barrels, you know, and we had a salesman and this guy, he was a good friend of mine, but me and him did not see eye to eye on anything. And this dude would leave in the morning come back about 4 30 in the afternoon grab an ice cream out of the break room and a coke oh, he'd yeah. eat his ice cream drink his coke smoke a cigarette and go home when a lot of times we were working 7 8 8 30 at night getting things done and this dude's you know he's getting paid more than me he's you know he's not doing anything you know and he just kind of made me mad well one day he came in for his daily ritual of ice cream and Coke <laughs> and his cigarette. Well, he sat down at the shop foreman's desk. Well, of course, I'm with a hand buffer and I'm slinging this scale all over the place. Well, he whistles at me. He doesn't even get up. He just whistles at me. I stop and I look at him. He goes, take that barrel outside. You're hitting me with scale. And I only had like maybe a foot left of this barrel. And I was like, nah, and I just went back to go. <laughs> well, anyway, now he claps and whistles at me. And I look at him and say, what do you need? And by this time, I, you know, maybe six <laughs> inches left of this barrel. He said, I said, take that outside. I said, I'm not taking it outside for six inches. And I went back and I was finishing it up. He went and unplugged my buffer. Mm -mm. Now, looking back, 
yes, this is a safety issue. Nobody's wearing safety glasses. I'm slinging, I, I'm, I'm singing, I'm slinging all these scale deposits all over the shop. Yeah, probably could get stuck in your eye and probably wouldn't be real <laughs> fucking great or anything. But when he put unplugged my buffer, I. I don't know what I was thinking. I punched him right in the throat, dude. I mean, just yeah. that quick. It was, you know, like, what the fuck are you thinking, you know? Uh, of course, my shop foreman's going crazy. Oh, my God, you can't be hitting people in the throat, Gary. You know, just so I plug my buffer in and I finish out my barrel, you know? Now, looking back, I see all the problems that I had in that situation. But at that moment, <clears throat> during that moment, I did not see what I was doing wrong. I was working. You're sitting there eating ice cream. You see what I'm saying? Like, Well, yeah, no. But that was also a normal for us in the military. It's a fist yes. fight. Fist oh, fight yeah. over with. Like, fist fight and then buy each other a beer and call it good. Yeah. You know? I mean, I no, know I, 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 I some I, of my best friends. I, I, I'm right there with you because – after the military, which in PT, we did PT every day. What was it? Zero six. We had to be there. Yeah. Yeah. So being late wasn't a thing. No. Right. You're not allowed. I remember my first job out of the military. I, uh, I worked at PetSmart. Yeah. And that was when I found out people could be late to work. And my mind was blown. I was like, <laughs> you can just be late? And like, they don't get mad? This is the most fire fun. I felt like when people were showing up late, I had to do push-ups or something. I'm like, this, uh-uh. You know? America. But it's that, you know, it's that transition to civilian life that is so tough. And I got a couple people that I know that are going, getting out of the military, I think I said last time. And I'm, I'm trying to, like, get them ready for it, like, this transition. Oh, yeah. Because it's they're different. So, not the same. So different. So, but so, anyways, this was before I started dating that girl or whatever. So, I mean, I had a lot of little instances where, you know, my temper got the best of me. Um, I know, like when I first moved back home, uh, me and my brother got like in a fist fight at a barbecue at my dad's house, and my dad, you know, like had to separate us. You know, it turned out bad, you know, but um, I didn't realize that I was the problem in all this. No, yeah, you don't think about it that way. You know, so I started You're, dating this girl. Everyone else is fucked up. Oh, yeah. Everyone <laughs> else is the one that's fucked up. So I started dating this girl, and I mean, like, we were like oil and water. We should have never dated in the first place, but for some reason, we made it work for about two years. And it was just, oh, my God, every day it was something stupid. We fought about the dumbest things. But the the thing about it is she, like, one day, just out of nowhere, we got in an argument that morning. Like, this is how bad it was with us. At this point, I am strung tighter than hell. I am so, like, just ready to go off. Just like this, boom, 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 I'm ready. You give me half a reason to get mad, and I'm going to go crazy. So, anyways, the first time she stayed the night at my house, she woke up, because she had to be at work a lot earlier than I did. Well, she woke up. She couldn't find her key, like her keys to her car. She wakes me up and starts bitching at me because she can't find her keys. <laughs> and, of course, you know, I'm that guy that's waiting Say something. Say something. And I'm coming at you, too, you know. She starts flipping out. I can't find my keys. Where are my keys? Boy, I popped out of that bed, and I said, they're probably in the last place you left them. You know? And, I mean, of course, that helps. Yeah, no, it does. You, if you have a woman that is seeing red because she can't find keys. You tell her stuff like that. Yeah. That, that, that calms them down. Yeah, no, perfectly. it does. Just like saying calm down. Oh, yeah. I found yeah. out through another girl I dated. Yeah. Um, I just told her one day calmly, eh, just calm down. And yeah, perfect. she stopped to mid sentence 
calm down. Did you just tell me to calm down? No, no I think you misunderstood what I was telling you. Just kidding. But no, <laughs> so I get, I get, of course, you know, we, we have our arguments or whatever. About a year and a half into dating, one day she just comes to me and she sits down with me and she says, look, because she had a little boy, you know, that lived with us or whatever. She said, look, I don't know what it is, but you got to go get help. She said, this stuff that you're doing, if it continues, I can't, I can't deal with it. I don't want my son around it. I don't want, I don't want to be around it. I don't think it's right. So I go to the VA here in Odessa. Uh, I just walk in and like I check in at the front or whatever. And they call my number. I go up to the desk and I just tell the guy, the little receptionist guy said, look, little I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just looking for help. I said, I don't want nothing from nobody. Y'all could put me on some medication, whatever. Just, you know, calm my ass down a little bit. You know, that's all I need. Uh, um, and it just so happened that the guy that covers our area with, like, doing the, uh, like, the disability stuff was in, in, ta- or in his office that day. He said, well, I need, to, I need you to go talk to him. It's like, all right. So I sit out in the waiting room, and I'm looking around, and I'm seeing all these guys that are, you know, like, well, not, well, like Vietnam vets and shit like that, you know, and I'm like, now these guys fought a fucking war. Now this is, you know, I'm, I'm sitting with fucking awesome dudes, you know. So anyway, the guy calls me in his office. Now let me back up. Time out. When I was married, my ex-wife told me I needed to go get help one time and I had to see a civilian doctor. And I, I guarantee you, that his doctor's certificate still had wet ink on the son of a bitch. The kid's like 22. And we walk in this room and it's, he's got it lit kind of like a seance room. So I'm already feeling a little odd. And he starts asking me questions. Well, I'm answering his questions with yes or no answers. I'm not, you know, I don't even feel like we're in the whole situation of me getting help yet he just keeps asking me questions did you go to combat did you do this did you yes yes no yes this goes on for like 30 minutes widener the dude breaks a clipboard and says well if you can't help yourself i can't help you either i said you're probably right (laughs) so right then right then i walked out i was like fuck i told my ex-wife like there ain't no help for me i tried (laughs) there's nothing there. So, so anyway, I walk into this guy's office and he asked me, he was like, so what, what's going on with you, man? I said, look, my, my girlfriend's threatening to leave me because she says I'm crazy. You got any pills or something that you can just give me and, you know, kind of calm me down or something. He has me fill out this questionnaire. So I start filling it out and man, I get to look and I was like, man, there's a lot of boxes I had to check yes on, you know? I was like, eh, ain't no big deal. So anyway, he goes, well, are you planning on hurting yourself today? I said, I'm not the one I'm worried about hurting. It's everybody else around me. I, I don't, I don't want to inflict pain on myself, but if somebody pisses me off, I'd rather inflict it on them. <clears throat> and, um, as we said in the, the previous, you know, journeys, we drove a lot of miles. We saw a lot of IEDs. We saw a lot of bullshit, right? So anyway, there was a therapist in-house that he had me go see, like, that day. I walk in there, and there's this lady sitting there, and she goes, what's going on? So I explained to her, you know, like, how I have these little outrages and these, (laughs) you know, these certain ways of looking at things and told her, you know, explained to her, I don't like being around crowds because, you know, I just don't, you know, driving down the road, I see a piece of trash. It usually doesn't turn out well or whatever. This lady straight up looks me in the eyes and you know what she tells me? You can go anywhere you want. Nobody cares about you. 
they're not paying attention to you. Perfect. And you can drive any way you want to because there's not going to be a bomb that goes off on the side of the road driving down the highway. <clears throat> and I walked out of there thinking, like, God damn, Doc, I'm fixed. Thank you. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know? So, anyways, he gets me with this lady in Midland. She's a civilian working for the vet center in Midland. I'm doing great with her. She's really helping me. I'm starting to see things in a different light. They try some medications out on me that, you know, different ones, and finally they get it right. Um, come to find out I had sleep apnea, all kinds of shit that they helped me out with, you know, that I wasn't expecting. But, you know, going in there just wanting to get some help, you know, obviously. And then all of a sudden I was getting help, and it was pretty cool. Until the day I go see my therapist, which I have an issue with people leaving, you know, like being abandoned, abandonment issues, I guess you could say. <laughs> she takes a job in Granbury, and she's no longer going to be my therapist. She goes, like, but we have great people here. I was like, you know what? No, I'm good. You know, I'm good. And I, I, have, very, I have been very fair about this. I've told my friends that are veterans that are in this area to go see these people. I mean, she helped me out tremendously. Um, and she was great, but when she left, man, I was like, fuck, how <clears throat> fucked up do you got to be that even your therapist leaves? <laughs> I went through three of them in Lubbock. <laughs> I'm on- I, had to, I had to go see one in Lubbock, a civilian one. Yeah, uh, when, when we were doing all this, you know, this, uh, where they were getting me to in front of different doctors, they wanted different doctors to look at me and. But I had to go see a lady in love. It. She was the yeah. last one I went and saw. But, uh, but yeah, that's that's how I ended up going to get help. And uh, I'm not gonna lie, it was a it was an eye opener when I realized that the problem was me. Um, I feel that maybe some of the issues that I had in my marriage. Some of the issues I had with ex-girlfriends, some of the issues that I had with family, I realized that some of that probably could have been helped if I would have sought help a little sooner. Absolutely. Um, I was just too, I was too proud to do it because, well, like I said, when my ex-wife told me to go get help the first time, I went to the VA in DFW or in Dallas area. And when I walk in there and I see guys missing legs, faces blown up, you know, fucking arms missing and shit, because that's a huge VA hospital. Yeah. And I see all this and I'm thinking, these guys need help. This shit's just in my head. There ain't nothing wrong with me. These guys, these guys need the help. And when I explain that to the guy that helped me with my disability and everything, he told me, this is how it works. The government budgets to help people. And to help veterans. And if veterans don't come forward and get their help, their budget gets cut for the next year. I did not realize that they budgeted for new veterans that needed help. I didn't, I didn't realize that. So he said, you can't look at it as you're taking away from this guy that had his legs blown off or whatever. You got to look at it as you got to get your help because if you don't, the next veteran that comes along, if they cut funding, you're screwing him out of help. True. Yeah. And I never saw it that way. So, but yeah, that's how I ended up going to get help. And, uh, and honestly, I feel that it's helped out tremendously. I have not had those kind of fits in a while. I can tell when I don't take my medication, I get in a, you know, I start feeling that that little wind get winded up yes. a little more, you know, and uh, getting upset about the dumbest shit ever. But, um, but yeah, that's how that's how I went to go get help. And, it's good. You know. I mean, it takes. I think that if somebody knows that they have an issue like that, and you don't, you have to know that you need it. Because if yeah. you know you need it, that gives you a little kick in the ass. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
And that's what and I. And sometimes it takes somebody telling you. You know, like with me, it took somebody to tell me because I wasn't looking at it as I needed help. I was looking at it like either get on my page or get the fuck out of the way. Yeah. Well, that's how that's how everyone was looking at it. But it's I mean, it's it's the culture we were, we were in, too. Like we're in the yeah. cougars, right? Like, yeah, you don't talk about your issues with that. Yeah. Stuff. You don't go to sick call. You don't, you know, you did none of that stuff because you I remember we went to the field for a field problem one time and chiggers ate my ass up. Like from my waist down, the chiggers just, you know, and I don't know if people know what chiggers are, but they're kind of like a mosquito, but instead of biting you, they embed themselves under your skin. Yeah, it's, it's not it's chiggers. Yeah. And I had, I mean, I put in to go to sick call the next morning. And first sergeant asked me, what is wrong with you? I told him, I said, I have all these red bites, you know, all these chigger bites. He said, let me look at them. So I dropped my pants and I showed them to him. He goes, Wadzik, I'm missing a leg and I'm not going to sit call. I pulled my pants up and I went right back out to the field. No, it's just, and that's what we talked about in the other podcast too. It's the culture of you don't want to get help. But, you know, it took me to realize when we've, when I first got out in 08, the girl that I was dating at the time, my jealousy issues were out of control. And that's not who I am. Like, I was so jealous when she'd get off work. I had her route timed to when she'd get to the house. And if it took longer, I was on the phone. Yeah. See, so, I, I've i never been the jealous type. So, like, I've never worried about where somebody was. Now, yeah, if it's... Like two hours after you're supposed to be home, yeah, I'm calling. Hey, what? Did you stop off somewhere? Did you have a breakdown? What's well, that's going the thing. I, I never have either, and that's when I knew I was like, I'm a little throwed off right now. Um, so no, I mean, bottom line is, if you know that you need to go seek help for your, well, and then I also had, you know, we started this be- because of Hill and yeah. what happened to him. I've been there. Yeah. I've been there, and I knew that wasn't me either. And that's really what sealed the deal for me. It's like, I need to take advantage of this free help that's there. Yeah, there's a, you know, and honestly, if if that girl would have never told me, hey, you need help. If you don't get help, I'm leaving, whatever, which she ended up leaving anyway. Um, but at least I'm getting help now. Yeah. But if she wouldn't have done that, I would probably still to this day not been back into a VA yeah. and you know, and I look at my life in the last two or three years, it would have been totally different. Yeah. But yeah, you know, and that's part of it. And I, I try to be, cause my kids are 13 and 14 and I try to be as honest as I can with them. Um, I try to explain to them what is going on with their dad. Because they see their dad take their medicine. Um, you know, they see their dad at, when he was going crazy. Now they see this dad that's, you know, kind of mellowed out. You know, there's a lot of things that, uh, that you know, I try to be honest with my kids. I don't want them to ever not know what's going on. Yeah. Um, I feel that we have a very good relationship where we can be honest with each other about stuff like that. Uh, I'm sure there's stuff that my kids don't tell me because, I mean, who's really going to tell their parent everything they're doing? But, I mean, I would like to say that we have a pretty open relationship. And, I mean, I'm sure there's some things that get left out, but. Yeah, you know, but yeah. no, and you know, with what we're talking about about the getting the help, <clears throat> I've probably had in the last two years because of what I do, um, at least ten people tell me that they took my advice and went and got help, and that yeah, you know, like just and to hear that it's just like shit we weren't in that culture you know what i mean no. like, how no. different would it be for 
some of the cougars because some of the, some of the cougars, man, we know they're not in the right mind space. I remember when we got back, they had that serious talk that said, Hey, look, some of y'all are probably having some issues now that we're back stateside. If you need to go talk to a chaplain or I don't go talk that. to it. I, I do. And I remember everybody was all laughing like, oh, yeah, I've got PTSD. Oh. Like yeah. they're all like it was a joke. Like yeah. we joked about it. It wasn't a thing. It wasn't well, something that was going to hurt be, us. We didn't want to be that guy. Yeah. No one yeah. wanted to be that guy in that room. You know what I mean? No, no, because we felt like we'd let somebody down if we were that guy. Yeah. We felt like we'd let that guy next to us down if we were that guy that has issues. Yeah. So. I'm, I mean, I'm sure there's, there's some of us that went, but played it off like they didn't and good on them, you know, yeah. just wish those of you that went, congratulations. Yeah. Like there's nothing wrong with it. it. You jumped out in front of all of us. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, it's just important. I guess what we're getting at is it's important to, to notice that you need it. And that's okay. I, if you know, I that. almost would suggest that anybody that gets out of the military that spent any time in combat, or even if you didn't spend con- time in combat, I suggest at least going to get some kind of screening from somebody that is not, uh, uh, But anyways, <laughs> you making it? I don't know. What happened? Uh, I don't know what this is. I'll have to check in a minute. But anyways, um, <clears throat> I got a text that I'm not understanding. All right. Well, oh, okay. So anyways, um, they were telling you know the deal was was like. Yeah. You just lost your train of thought. No, Yeah, it just totally threw me off. What you're saying is you suggest anyone to go get screened. Yeah, anybody that gets out, I, I suggest them go get screened. I know when you get out, you have your out processing or whatever, you know. But when you're out processing, you ain't thinking about the future. You're thinking about getting out of the military. Yeah, you're like, fuck, I'm done with this shit. Oh, yeah. So... Um, it is one of those deals where I felt that if I would have took it a little more serious when I got out, I'd have been better off, but it was one of those deals that I couldn't take it serious because I couldn't be that guy. I couldn't be the one that let down my brothers. I couldn't be the one that showed weakness. Well, yeah, and, you know, that goes in the whole, everyone handles things differently. Um, You know, like we have the sexual assault survivors on both sides, male and female. Um, You know, we know that a lot of it doesn't get reported because of they feel embarrassed about it or, you know, like we need to get over that. We need to get over that culture. Just like how do you, how do you, explain to somebody we have to get over that culture how do you sit down with somebody who has went through that kind of trauma or that kind of you know thing and say look get over yourself go get help well you know it's got to be understood that it'd be an example for people if people looked at it that way it's like leading from the front being an nco you know, yeah. it's you're you're leading by example. And, yeah. you know, it's hard to talk about some of the stories like I get that. But if you look at it like this could potentially help more people because you decided to speak up. Like, I mean, that's the mindset that I have when I think about it like that. And that's why yeah. I told my story like we're that's why we're doing this. Yeah. You know, but it's never you know, gonna be perfect. You know, it's like we were talking before we started. 
you know, the one thing that I brought up, like, man, I, I hope we're helping people. Yeah. Because th- these last, these last five episodes that we've done last five week journey that we went on talking about all this stuff has been hard. Oh, absolutely. And then we ask people to come on our show and do it in an hour. Yep. Here, here's an hour. Tell us your most fucked up situation you've ever been in. And we're going to critique people that are going to see it. Yeah. To a bunch of people that you don't know. I mean, it's hard. Yeah. But we, ha- I have a new respect for those that come on the show. Absolutely. Um, I always, you know, Held them, held them in high regard because they were willing to do it. But now that we've sat in the hot seat and done it, oh my God. Like, this, I commend every one of them. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's different when the camera's on you. Spotlight mm-hmm. on you. Yeah, because it's easy to sit back and drink whiskey and smoke cigarettes and listen to somebody else's story. You know, I mean, yep. yeah, you're there for them, but it's hard. It's hard when you're the one having to tell the, the story or, yeah. the, you know, the issues. So, like I said, um, you know, I hope that we're helping people. That was the whole point of this. I think we um, are. I've had a few people reach out to me already. More than yeah. a few. Um, One of the things, I asked you this before the show, and I actually was going to wait until you, until we were on the show to ask you this, but I figured I would give you a, uh, give you a chance to think about it. I got asked by somebody what my biggest regret about the military was. Um, I, I know I told you what my answer was and you told me what your answer was, but my thing, when you think about the whole as a whole, what the the one thing that I prepared for that never happened was I never got to die for my country. Um, I feel that from day one, that's what I was in pre- preparation for. That's what, well, like we talked about <clears throat> going through basic training, they molded you that way, anyways. They, they, they. Yeah, that, that's how they molded you from day one in basic training was because it was such a big possibility, especially what we were doing. Yeah, You know what I mean? Um, so I think everyone, every one of us that went together as the Cougars would have bared that cross with honor. With honor, yes. Um, yeah. I mean, that was something that I'm not going to lie. The plane ride home. As happy as I was to be going home, I can't tell you how many times I thought how it could have been different. Yeah. A different plane ride home. You know, yeah. and um and then you got you know, with that being said, you got people that like Hill, for example. We have the saying in the army, he's not a garrison soldier. Right. Some people don't know how to act outside of combat. No. Some people. No, and that was Hill. Hill was always in trouble. He was always going to. He got in trouble in Iraq. He was always in trouble because he just, if he wasn't feeding that fire of combat, nothing oh, yeah. would to him. You know what I mean? I mean, think about it. When we were, when we were in Garrison, I mean, he went AWOL. He was always in trouble for something. Yeah. You know, I mean. But when we go to Iraq, he's one of the best soldiers we have. Oh, absolutely. Everyone wanted Hill. Yeah. Um, but, no, I think that's how we are groomed. And I, I've thought about that numerous times. But when you asked me if I'd changed anything in the military, my first answer was, well, I wish I could whoop my recruiter's ass. That's one of my <laughs> good answers <laughs> for lying. I think we all. I think we all wanted to whoop our recruiter's ass um, at some point. But then I said not be a 13 Bravo. But being a 13 yeah. Bravo is what made me, you know, the person that I am today. And yeah. knowing the people that I know today, I, I wouldn't change anything. Um, I say get, I shouldn't have got out, but 
I wouldn't have my family that I have today. I wouldn't have my right. three of my girls. Um, I wouldn't change anything. I don't think I would. I think I, I fast tracked into E5 pretty quick and I got to lead troops and we had our experiences and I don't, I just can't think I wouldn't even change the wreck that I was in. Yeah. I wouldn't change almost catching a mortar. Like I wouldn't change the IEDs. I wouldn't change the small arms. I w none of that. It's just because it grew me to be the father, the husband, and just the person I am today. I ain't scared of a damn thing. There's not one thing in this world that scares me. Um, I learned how to love in a brotherhood and I love unconditionally the people that I care about. And I learned that from the army and I learned that. And, and, you know, the army grooms leaders too. And I became hell of a leader and I became, I wouldn't be where I'm at in my career if I didn't have that. Um, so I, I can't think of really anything that I'd change. I would, you know, I, I would change a person or two that I hurt. Not intentionally, but that's when right. I, did, I had my issues. Yeah. But honestly, I was I I think I had a pretty successful run at the uh, the army. One of the things that I I'm the most thankful for is the fact that I can be given a direction, and without question, I just do it. Um, with with my job you know, with life in general. Um, the, the, the field that I'm in, I have a lot of knowledge in it and I have a lot of experience in it for the fact that I didn't want to just know the minimum to get me by. Yeah. I, I wanted to know my job. I wanted to know the guy above me's job. I wanted to know the guy below me job. And I wanted to do it all. And that way it didn't matter if somebody called in sick or was late or whatever, it get done. The, jo the job's still going to get yeah. done. And I, I, I owe all that to the military. Yeah. I owe every bit of that to the military because I guarantee you without that experience, without knowing, uh, you know, the, jo the job above you and the job below you and knowing how important it is to be sufficient, uh, be, proficient you know and everything else i'd i'd be like every other civilian out there that yeah. just didn't give a shit you know and if i work for someone i mean i'm that's you know it's it's it, i treat it just like the military where as far as yeah all right this is where i'm at i'm gonna do you the best job i can until the day i i don't yeah. <laughs> Well, and you know, that's, I, and there's a big reason why companies um, target veterans. Because what you just said is you got to know the job below you and the job above you. And as mm -hmm. the dedicated veterans that give a shit, and you know, you got your shammers and that didn't really oh, yeah. care that slipped by, which is fine. Yeah. But the people that wanted to, you know, learn, they gave you that skill set. So I'm still 15 minutes early to everything. <laughs> I'm not even lying. And if I have someone that I set up for a meeting or something, they they're not 15 minutes early. I question it. So I'm like, eh. <laughs> um, do you really want this meeting or not? Yeah, you better get your ass here. But no, I think um, with that being said, all that. So what keeps you? What keeps me what? What keeps you going? What keeps you level-headed? Man. Um, the oil my school? goals. My goals. Um, my girls. My girls keep me level-headed to a certain point. Um, well, there's times with my kids where I feel like uh, I made a lot of mistakes when they were younger that I feel like I may be trying to overcompensate for now. No. Um, I mean, they keep me grounded, but the goals that I have in life that are, that I haven't got to do yet. Like I want a ranch, you know, that's, that's been my goal for a long time. I want my own ranch. I want, 
you know, I want all this stuff. And I know I'm not going to get it if I just give up. Um, but I don't know. I, I, that's a hard question. I might have to get back on you on that because, I mean, there's a numerous things that keep me grounded now. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's a crazy question. Well, huh? That is a hard question. Well, I mean, you know, it, you know, to be fair is you don't, you're not in the position in life that I'm in with my wife and kids and stuff. No, not, not at all. Not you even know, close. So, so that's what keeps me going. What keeps me going is it keeps, you know, I got a wife. You met my wife. Fucking saint. What she sees in you, I don't know. I don't either. That's no one's ever told <laughs> Widener what to do outside of the military. No one's ever told Widener really what to do. And see, and that's what I, what I I'm gonna go back to on what I said earlier. I made a lot of mistakes early on with my kids. Kids don't come with a fucking instruction manual. I no. mean, even if they're even if they did, I probably threw the motherfucker in the trash. Um there's things that I kind of realized that took me forever to realize I have girls. Well, yeah. I have daughters. And their chemical balance is way different than mine. So what I thought was acceptable and what I thought was in their best interest probably hurt them more than I helped them. Yeah. Um, now, as you get older, you start realizing the things that you screwed up on, like, you know, and you're like, oh, shit, maybe I should have done that different. But instead of apologizing and trying, you know, you just try to do something, you try the different way. Then you send your kids into some kind of shock, like, why is dad being like this? He's usually yelling by now. Well, you know, no, like, so what I was saying is, sorry about that. You know, I have a wife that. You know, in what I do now, no one tells me what to do. I'm I'm the boss, right? I I I, I fell into that position, and I've been in leadership for years and years now. And you better believe I'm doing something stupid. My wife's gonna be like, "What the fuck are you doing, Widener?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh shit, I don't know." <laughs> so then I take a step back. I'm like, "Yeah." Um, well, it sounded like a good idea until you mentioned it, it, it and you called me out. Like that. Um, but I have my three girls. Like, I'll have the worst days at work, come home, and my oldest is always, welcome home, daddy. That's the first thing that comes out of her mouth. I forget mm -hmm. about my day at that point. And then I see my youngest that's turning one this week just running around making baby noises. I'm like, why was I even stressed out about shit? This is what I yeah. got. So that's yeah. what keeps me going. Um, yeah. And that's a good thing to keep going. And like I said, I mean, that is something – you know, me and you have had talks before, um, kind of, especially when this quarantine shit started, you know, we've had all these talks about, man, you, you know, the problems that you're having aren't that big or the, the problems yep. you're having, somebody would love to have those problems, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, I believe and, and I mean, it, it's sometimes, like you said, you have to sit back to see it i do ask you somebody reached out to me today mm -hmm. um her son just joined the military and she got the phone call today from him with the red cross number uh -oh. and said here's the number of red cross if there's any emergencies call that and had to hang up now we've all been there we know what it's like what advice do you have to a mother that is experiencing this for the first time. Experiencing son being in the military? Yeah, son leaving for the first time. Son going to be, you know, be transformed into a man in the next well, six to eight months. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, the advice I have is right now, I mean, we, we all know this. It's a different time than when we joined, right? Yes. We joined in a time of, a boom in war. And that's what it is. Now the potential of a war breaking out in two months, we don't know. Um, but what I would say to a mother and what my mother did for me, be confident in your child. 
Have that confidence that your child is going to be okay. Have that confidence your child is going to take all the training and all the the skills that they're going to get seriously. Because if you're not confident in that, first off, if you don't think your kid would make it in the military, sure to try to talk him out of the damn thing. <laughs> because that's our first problem. Second, that's your first problem. If, if, if you're not confident in him, your kid's going to pick up on that, and that's not going to help him whatsoever, him or her. You know yeah. what I mean? And um, what, I, what I told her, I said, I understand things are hard right now because she's like, man, I just want to talk to him a little longer. I want to know what's going on, I, you know, blah, blah, blah. She, you know, her big deal is the fear of the unknown, you know. She don't know what he's going through. She don't know all that. But it's like I, you know, I told her, I said, think of how proud you're going to be. Yeah. When he shows up at your front steps wearing those, wearing that uniform, you know, whatever the hell they wear these days. Yeah. I don't know what they wear. I, um, no, no, you're right. But also, you need to tell that person that the people, you can go into a military. And I just, I use the army, for example, because that's what we did. Yeah. I had no particular set of skills that the army desired. Um, but the people put in charge of making these young men and women into whole different people have the skill set that it's needed. Yes. Now the people that join have to be, re they want it. They have to want to be receptive of that, the yeah. learnings and teachings. So have faith in your child and then have faith in the military that they're going to get them there. Yeah. I agree. And, but you also got to keep that, that line of communication open also. So if you got a child in basic training or whatever, I know one person that has a kid over in, um, in Bragg or Benning right now. And she actually commented and um, just keep that line of communication open with your child and let them know that they can talk about the hard stuff with you. Because right. I had that with my mother, and that helped me. I still have it with my mom, and I'm 36 years old. But if you have that, the confidence in your kid, confidence in the instruction, and the open communication, there's not much more you need to have or can do, honestly. Yeah. You know well, see, I mean? that's one thing I can say about my mom. Um, her, her dad was in the military. Her dad was a combat veteran. And so she already kind of knew that I was going to be taken care of in the way of training and the way of knowing what I'm supposed to do and in certain situations and stuff. So, um, she was very encouraging. Now, yeah, I wish I could get her on here to tell the story about when I called her from Korea, because that was great. Um, the things that were running through her mind, I'm sure it was, I mean, to hear her tell the story is hilarious, but um, it's one of those deals that, you know, my daughters, they've kind of brought up the military. Honestly, I wouldn't mind if my daughters went Air Force or something because they're smart enough to do it. Um, I don't really much want them, per se, to follow my footsteps, uh, especially now that they're letting... Uh, females get into combat yeah. MOSs. And it's not because I don't think my daughters could handle it, because I'm sure they could. It's just the fact that I know what I went through, and I wouldn't want my daughters to go through that. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of one of those things. Um, but I, I, there's no doubt in my mind that they could handle it. Either way. So... But yeah. I'm going to be supportive, whichever. But, I mean, I'm going to sit down with them. I'm going to explain the ugliness that could come of it. There's more There's more to being in the so, military than just saying, hey, I'm going to join the military, you know? that You know, that what you just said, is I agree with 100%. I would not want them to go through what I went through. I got uh, a buddy of mine, actually Nathan Black, that just commented. And he joined the Marines and he was in the Marines for a long time. And I asked him not to, because at this point we're already back from our, our deployments and stuff. And I wouldn't ask anybody to go through what we went through. No. You know, because I'm not saying this as, 
Like we're bad, the most badasses people there is. But there's a lot of people that couldn't handle those deployments. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So that's why I asked my buddy Nathan. I said, like, hey, just don't do that because, you know, but I, I just, I like you said, I support my daughters too. Anything they want to do. Now, if she says, if she <laughs> says she's going to sign up for a 13 Bravo, I'm fighting that recruiter. I promise you that. <laughs> I, prom- I promise you. get sideways and fight oh, we are, we are. We're going to go turning some dirt in the front yard, and that's okay. <laughs> I'll get my revenge through my old recruiter on him. But <laughs> um, oh, like, oh, man, I would love to be a fly on the wall. <laughs> daughter goes, Dad, I want to be 13 Bravo. <laughs> I'd just break right then. I'd, just, I'd, I'd short circuit, but <laughs> I don't know. Um, just, you know, everyone – just keep on keeping on. That's what I, that's all I ask. That's, that's, that's I don't, I don't know. We, we've, we've taken up a lot of the podcast time these past six weeks, wait, five weeks, last, next week, yeah, six. five weeks. Yeah. Just kind of talking about us. And it's not because we're trying to be, you know, greedy, like, look at us, look at us. It's because you guys need to know too, that we've seen our fair share of, the unpleasantry situation, unpleasant the ugliness, the ugliness. So, and we've been there. We've been around the world. We've we we've done it. We've seen combat. We've seen things that we just never wish anyone to see. And you guys had to kind of hear a side of us, and that's why yeah. we did this. Yeah. You know, it's um, it's good that I think it's good we did this. I I think so too. I think that uh. I think going forward, it's going to kind of open our eyes to what our our guests will have to go through. Um, speaking of which, um, anybody who wants to be a guest, message us, get with us, and we'll talk to you a little bit. Because I do want to keep going every Wednesday on this podcast like we yeah. have been. It's become a good habit. Yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, our next step is find out who our next guest is going to be. I have a few in mind. Um, do I do. I do. Okay. But, you know, the one thing we're not going to do on this podcast, as we said, and I think our first one, is we're not going to go, we're not going to come and talk about current events and the situation that things are in. No. You know, that's not we're what not we're going to get into the political aspect. Yeah. Of. We're here. If to you want to watch that, that's on the, Legends of Bourbon. Um, we usually really. get a little wild and eh. <laughs> say whatever on that yeah. one. That's just and if you that. and if you catch it when we're live, usually it's even better because we the next day we usually delete that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but no, everyone, thanks for tuning in. I don't have much more to say. Just um, I don't either. If you if you if you know you need the help, you need the help, and that's fine. You can always message the message the channel. Like we yeah. respond to those, and we. You but yeah, to- also, like we said before, like, share, go give the YouTube some love. We need some more uh, subscribers yeah. on that yeah, YouTube, YouTube is channel. Hurting. Man, we got three this week, so I'd like to see what five next week. I, and we have almost all our videos on there too. Yeah. So, so if you miss the episode, if you want to, it's all on YouTube. Go check it out. Um, you can see us from day one. Uh, background's kind of changed on my end, but Widener still I'm, looks the same. Yeah. You know, but uh, you realize we've been doing this for like eight months now. It's insane. It is crazy. Insane. I was looking at that. Eight months we've been doing this, and and I, I enjoy every minute of it. Yeah. I do too. No, it's fun. I was I was real tired today. My wife was like, "Are you up for it?" And I'm like, "I have to be." And then got on, started, and it was great. So yeah, and it's, it's like I told you before. You know, this is very therapeutic for me too. You know, I mean, this is uh, it kind of lets us see that there's other people out there that have heard as much as we have. You know? Sure, sure. But um, um, we do appreciate it. Come see us next Wednesday. Uh, I guess we're going to try to make this a deal 
every Wednesday at seven thirty my time, six thirty Widener's time. Yep. We're gonna try to make this a deal. So yeah. y'all right. come back and see us. All right, everyone have a good evening and we will go from there. Love y'all.